Really? You don't say. So you're telling me that you carve all your guitars out of a giant block of wood using nothing more than your grandpa's Swiss Army knife? That's amazing. But you know, I'm going to stick with CNC because that's where the future is. In today's video, I'm going to make good on a promise to shoot some videos where I talk about my cam strategies. And in a previous video, I'll post a link up above, I had talked about the cam strategies I use for making a fretboard. So the next step, the logical step, is my cam strategies for making a guitar neck. And that's what I'm going to talk about in this video. And what I plan to do as well is I'm going to create a playlist for these videos. So if you're wondering, you know, which video I talk about fretboards and which I talk about necks and where I talk about guitar bodies, you can find all those videos there. And uh, hopefully next week or, uh, you know, sometime in the not too distant future, I'll post up a video where I'll talk about the cam strategies for the body. And uh, to find that playlist, I will put a link down in the description below. So let's jump in and get started. The first thing I have to do when I am going to set up my cam strategies for the neck is I have to create a full size, full scale, top down view of the guitar neck itself. And that's what you see on the screen here. This was set up in Adobe Illustrator. And it's actually a back view of the neck. So the, the side of the neck that has the contour and the back of the uh, perimeter shape of the neck. And this drawing contains all of the elements that I'm going to need to make the files that I will use to create my cam strategy. And that includes the perimeter shape of the neck itself, the headstock, and the heel area. It also has these little half round shapes. They look like little orange slices. Those are, uh, they represent the contour of the back of the neck. And I'll use that in Rhinoceros 3D to form the 3D contour of that shape. Uh, this also has a center line which is actually the truss rod slot. And that consists of the of both that center line as well as this little small rectangle. And that represents where the truss rod adjustment nut will go. And then on either side, I have two more lines, which are optional. Those are lines that I would use to route a slot to fit uh, carbon fiber stiffening rods. And sometimes I use those depending on the type of material that I'm going to be making the neck out of. So once I have this, the first element that I need to create is the slot for the truss rod. So I will remove all the elements except for the line in the center and that rectangle. And this is what the file looks like. This is going to be the truss rod slot. And what I'll do is I'll save this out as a .svg file. Then I will import that into Easel Pro, and that's what you see here. The file was imported on the uh, and the screen on the left side. And from here, I can uh, set up such details as the depth of the pocket. And in this case, it's 0.38 inches, which is how tall my truss rod is. Uh, the neck or the uh, adjustment nut slot or portion of the slot is 0.45 inches deep. And this line is cut just as a line. So the router or the, the bit's going to carve back and forth along this line until it achieves a depth of 3 eighths of an inch. And then this little pocket here for the truss rod adjustments nut will be cut as a pocket. So that's, that's basically how that's set up. And I'm using a quarter inch diameter two flute spiral up cut bit and the settings are I use the automatic settings because uh, Inventables has actually tested this combination of material and bit so this is what they've determined to be the best setting for that and it works really well it's 160 inches per minute feed rate 40 inches per minute plunge rate 
The depth of pass is 0.25 inches, which is equal to the diameter of the bit. The spindle speed is set to 16,000 RPM. Now you'll see here under fill method, the offset is set in this sort of counterclockwise fashion. That's actually what's known as a climb cut. Clockwise would be a conventional cut, but uh, climb cuts seem to work really well in wood. So that's, that's what is offered, and that's what I select here. And that only affects the slot for the, for the adjustment nut because it's a pocket. The rest of this, even though it looks like a pocket, is actually carved as a straight line. So the, uh, the tool just uh, moves back and forth along that line until it reaches its uh, uh, full depth. And then down here, I'm using a 20 degree ramp. And what the ramp does is it allows you to introduce the bit gradually into the wood as it starts the cut. Instead of plunging at 48 inches per minute all the way to quarter inch depth, which will put a lot of stress on the bit, it just gradually carves in at a 20 degree angle until it reaches that quarter inch depth. And then it begins to move along the line. So it's just a way of saving the bit and uh, reducing the stress on um, the, the, the tool as it's carving. So this operation uh, will take about a minute. So one minute to carve that slot. Now, uh, I want to take a minute here just to mention the material that I'm using is hard maple for this particular example, and that's what I often use for making necks. And when I set this up in, in Easel Pro, I set the width at 4 inches and the length of 30 inches and the thickness of 1.84 inches. That is exactly the dimensions of the blank that I'm going to use when I carve the neck. And this uh, to carve the neck, this is going to be a two-sided carving operation, which means this side and the other side, the opposite side that you can't see here, which would be resting on this grid that represents the wasteboard. When I finish carving this side, I have to flip the blank over to carve the other side. And I'm not going to get into the specifics about how I do that. I get questions about that all the time, but I've explained it numerous times in previous videos. In a future video series that I'm going to be starting here pretty soon, I will cover this in as much detail as I can, and I may break that out as a separate video so that I can answer folks' questions by simply providing them with a link. But uh, it, it's very simple. In a nutshell, it involves drawing a center line down the length and then a center line across the, the width and then extending those down the sides and the ends of the blank. And then I have two uh, perpendicular lines carved into the center of my wasteboard. So I can just set those lines right onto the engraved lines on the wasteboard and that will position it correctly. Then when I flip it over, I just reposition it to make sure that those center lines are right on the engraved lines on the wasteboard. And it's that's how I register the two-sided carving. But I'll show that uh, visually in a future video. Once I've cut the truss rod slot, the bit's going to return to the XYZ home position, which is always going to be in this lower left corner. And from there, I can proceed immediately with cutting the next operation, which in this case is going to be the front of the headstock. And as you can see, this screen looks very different than the screen with the truss rod slot. And the reason is the truss rod slot, as I said before, was an SVG file that was imported into Easel Pro. And when you do that, you can set up your uh, dimensions for your stock and you'll get this nice little simulation on the right side. However, in this case, I'm importing G-code that I created elsewhere. And the reason for that is because Easel Pro is great for carving pockets and you know vertical shapes, that sort of thing, drilling holes, pockets. However, when it comes to angles, curves, or anything that is three-dimensional, I have to use a different strategy. So I will use mesh cam to create my 3D uh, G-code files, which I can then import into Easel. So I'm sending all of my carving operations from Easel. However, while some of them are generated in Easel, others are generated in mesh cam. And this is a good example of the mesh cam generated file. And if you look at it, you can kind of see the headstock shape here. Uh, all these 
blue lines represent the movement of the bit as it carves out the wood to create that shape. And the red lines indicate rapid movements where the bit raises up above the material and moves quickly to another portion to continue with carving operations. So that's how it looks in Easel Pro. But let's jump over here to, uh, we'll jump into Rhinoceros. And this is the neck that I created. Now you'll remember with the Illustrator files, I had created the overall view of the neck. And I'll import these elements into Rhinoceros and then use those to build my fully three-dimensional uh, one to one scale neck. And this is what I will use to create those uh, G code files and the, the tool paths and the G code files that will be set up in MeshCam. And so once I've created this nice little model here, I can then bring it into MeshCam. And then I will set up my carving operations. Now for the headstock I'm going to be using two different operations and if you look at the left side of the screen you'll see this little white box here where it says rough operation and parallel finish. Those are my two carving operations. The first one will be a rough operation and for that I'm using the exact same bit that I used to carve the truss rod slot. It's a quarter inch diameter two flute spiral upcut bit and I have the feed rate set at 150 inches per minute, a plunge rate of 40 inches. The RPM is 16,000 RPM for the spindle. Step over is how far over the bit will carve with each pass. And in this case, I've set it for 40% of the bit's diameter. So that's like roughly 2, uh, 0.2 inches. And then the step down is 0.25 inches, which is equal to the diameter of the bit itself. Stock to leave is how much stock is going to remain after the carving operation is done so that the parallel finish can uh, carve it away to reveal a nice smooth finish. And for this one I'm setting it at 0 0.03 inches which I believe is the default in this program. Some operations I'll decrease a little bit but for this one 0 0.03 is fine. Now the type of carving operation, there's basically two types, 3D roughing and 2D roughing. I like 3D roughing because it, it, it more closely represents the shape of the surface that I'm carving. 2D is a much more, uh, it's, a, it's a much rougher stair-stepped appearance. And that can work well for some situations and it will actually allow you to carve out the shape faster when you use that 2D roughing. However, because of the pronounced stair step effect, when you go to do the finish pass, the bit's going to put a lot of stress on the material that it's carving. That is usually not an issue, but in certain situations, and I'll explain one here in a minute, that can be a problem. So I typically will stick with 3D roughing. It takes a few minutes longer, but the results are much easier for the finishing pass to clean up. Now the tool pass shape, there's two of them, parallel and contour. I use contour, and what that means is as the bit carves, it's going to follow the shape of this headstock and move in as it removes the material. With the parallel, what it does is it moves back and forth across the surface. And I find that the parallel strategy takes an awful long time, so I stick with the contour and it works just fine for me. Mill direction is climb. There's two choices here, climb or conventional. With climb, you're basically going to be cutting in a counterclockwise movement around the workpiece. With the conventional, it's going to be clockwise. Now, I've found that I get a better quality cut when I do a climb cut, so that's what I stick with. Yeah, it's not, it's not necessarily disastrous if you use a conventional cut. I just find it's better with the uh, climb cut direction. So that's what I set up for the, the roughing pass. And... If you look closely here, what I'll do is I'll go to the left side of the screen. You'll see where it says Machine Regions. If I click on that, we switch to a top view. And what this is, is it sets up, I can select an area to machine and exclude areas that I don't want machine. 
well, all I really need to do here is select an area that I want to machine, which is the headstock. And if you look closely, it may be kind of hard to see on the screen, but there's a kind of a pink rectangular box that is encompassing the whole front of that headstock. This is the only area that I'm going to be machining for this cutting operation. So that's how I will set up this initial headstock carving operation. And then once that rough cut is done, the second operation, which begins immediately after the rough cut, is a parallel finish path. And I'm using, again, the same bit, quarter inch diameter, two flute spiral up cut bit, 150 inches per minute, 40 inch plunge rate, and a spindle speed of 16,000 RPM. But I've reduced the step over from 40% of the bit's diameter to just 12% of the bit's diameter. That means each pass is gonna be very close to one another, and that's gonna uh, yield a much smoother finish. And then if you look down here, I have Y parallel selected as the mill direction. I can either do Y or X. Y means it's gonna run back and forth along the length of the headstock. If it was an X parallel, it would be carving from one side to the other. And I have found through experience that the Y parallel with the headstock gives me a much smoother finish. So smooth that I can usually jump to 220 grit sanding once it's uh, been carved out. And then I'll, I'll select the uh, don't machine the top of stock. And that's really just a precaution. Since I have the area selected, I really don't have to worry about that. But if by chance the bit were to carve up over where the angle meets the rest of the neck, it would carve out a tiny little ledge here. And I wouldn't want that. So by selecting don't carve the top of the stock, it won't do that. Now another important uh, f consideration with doing the, the front of the headstock is I'm only carving the front of the headstock. I'm not doing the shape, the depth of the shape. That I'll do later on when I carve the back. So I want to restrict my carving to just the front of the face. And to do that, over here on the left side of the screen under job setup, we have distance around geometry. That's normally set to the diameter of the largest bit that you're using. And since I'm using a quarter inch diameter bit, that distance around the geometry would normally be set to 0.25 inches. That way it would know to carve all the way down through that. And since I don't want to do that yet, what I've done is I, I, I'll actually set it for zero. And when I hit OK, the default is 0 0.0001 inches, which isn't actually zero. But since we're working in wood, for all intents and purposes, it is zero. And what that's going to do is it's going to restrict my carving operations to just the front of the headstock without carving the side. So here I'll hit the Calculate Tool Paths. And it's going to ask me, do you, are you sure you want the distance of the geometry set to zero instead of 0.25 inches? I, I, yes, I, I want that, but um, I'm going to click no so that it won't change that setting. And then it will calculate. And here you can see all these green lines represent the movement of the tool. And it's just carving the front of the headstock. So it's going to do both the rough and the finish uh, pass in this operation. Once I have the G code file written, I can save this to a folder on my hard drive where I keep all my G-code files. And of course, I'll name it something appropriate, uh, something that will reference the fact that it's the front of the headstock. And when I save it, I can select from my list of different um, post processors. And they have numerous post processors which uh, represent the most popular CNC machines that are out on the market. But there are so many CNC machines being manufactured now that they can't possibly uh, have a post processor for all of them. So if you don't see your machine listed, the best course of operation is to select basic G code dash inch, uh, which is what I have selected right here. And this works pretty well with most of your typical CNC machines, and it works well with the XCAR Pro. In fact, that's what Inventables recommends. So I'll select this processor. And what this is going to do is it's going to write the header and the footer into the G code file. And 
that is what is first read. Uh, the header is the first part that's read by the CNC machine when it's sent by the computer. So I typically am going to change that anyways, but for now I'll just select that basic G code dash inch and let it do its thing. So I'll so I'll hit OK and I'll save it out to the file where I want to save it. Then back in uh, Easel Pro, I can import that G code file by just simply going up to Project and then import G-code, and this is what it comes out as. And again, as I said before, this is the uh, both passes. It starts out, you can run the simulation down here at the lower part of the screen where the play and pause buttons are. But the first part of the cut is the rough cut, and that's where it's going to hog out most of the wood to achieve the headstock shape. And this is a 10-degree angled headstock. So it will cut that hog out all that wood and then once it's done it will immediately begin the finishing pass which is what you see right here and once that's complete the bit then raises up above the wood and returns to that XYZ home position here in the lower left corner at this point I will then jog the spindle completely away from the work uh, piece so I have complete access to the blank and then as I described before I'm going to unclamp the blank and then flip it over on the wasteboard make sure that the center lines are are in line with the lines that I engraved in the wasteboard so that everything is going to be nice and straight and, and indexed and then I'm ready to start the back carving operations and that will begin with a rough cut which is what you see here and you can probably sort of see an indication of a neck in all that mess but uh, again, this is the rough cut operation here, and the blue lines represent the movement of the bit, and then the red lines are the rapid moves when it moves from cutting one area to uh, cutting another area. And let me show you what the file is going to look like for this. So we'll jump into uh, first into Rhinoceros, and again, this is the 3D file that I created, and it's this side that I'm going to be carving the back of the headstock, the contour, and the heel section. So what I'll do is I will import that into MeshCam, and this is a completely different file because I had a file for the top and then a file for the back. Keeps it kind of organized and separate. And this is the file for the back. So you can see the neck here. And if you look closely, you can see this faint gray box around the uh, entire perimeter of the neck shape. And that represents the stock that it's going to be cut out of. And these red little, looks like tubes extending off the sides of the neck, those are tabs. And tabs are what keep the workpiece, the, the, or actually the, the neck itself, from dislodging from the workpiece once the bit has cut all the way through to the other side. If I didn't have tabs, once it cut through, this piece would be, would be completely free and separate from the blank, and it would start flying all over the place. The spindle would catch it and throw it all over, and it could become a, a dangerous, deadly uh, missile, not to mention the fact that the spindle would probably destroy the neck itself. So the tabs keep it held in place. To carve out this neck shape, I'm going to have to use three different carving operations. The f and if you look over at the little white box on the left side of the screen, you'll see what those operations are. The first at the top is the rough operation. And that will use the my trusty quarter inch diameter two flute spiral upcut bit. And Again, I have the feed rate at 150 inches per minute, the plunge rate 40 inches per minute, 16,000 RPM for the spindle, 40% step over and a 0.25 inch step down, which is equal to the diameter of the bit. Now in this one, the stock to leave, on the, the face of the headstock that I carved a moment ago, I had the stock to leave set at 0 0.03 inches. I've changed it here to 0 0.01, and the reason is, when I cut out the perimeter shape of the headstock, uh, well, actually the whole neck itself, the headstock itself is no longer going to be supported uh, 
through its depth. So if I leave 0 0.03 inches and then perform the finishing cut, the bit is going to start to push down on the headstock and it will deflect it ever so slightly, which can affect the quality of the finish. So by reducing it from 0 0.03 to 0 0.01, there's almost no deflection at all and I get a really smooth surface finish. So that's just one of those little things you learn through experience. And again, I'm using the 3D roughing because this is a 3D shape and I don't want that, um, that deep stair step effect that you get with the 2D roughing. Um, the, the tool pass shape, again, is going to be contour, so it will follow the contour shape of the neck rather than going back and forth across the width of it. It's just much faster. And again, I'm using a climb cut for uh, quality and speed. So that's basically what I have set up for the rough finish. Now for the parallel finish, I'm using a slightly different bit. It's a quarter inch diameter two flute spiral up cut like the one I use for the rough. But how uh, the difference is the rough cut is using a flat end mill, whereas for the finish I'm using a ball end mill. And I'm using basically the same settings, 150 inch per minute feed rate, 40 inch uh, per minute uh, plunge rate and at 16,000 RPM. But for the step over, I've reduced it from 40% down all the way to 6%. Now that's going to take a little bit of time to do this, to carve this, but the resulting finish is going to be so smooth, I can go right to 220 grit sanding to finish it out, uh, finish sanding the neck before applying uh, my finish. And the uh, Mill direction, once again, like the front of the headstock, is going to be following that Y axis, so along the length instead of across the width. Uh, this yields a really nice finish quality, but it does it very, very quickly. And I have don't machine stock, um, top of stock checked. It doesn't really matter for this because we're cutting down into the wood and we're going to be cutting this, the top anyways. Um, so I just leave that alone. And then the final operation is this pencil finish. And what a pencil finish is, it basically runs the bit all the way around the perimeter once. And it removes any tool marks left in the rough and the parallel finish that might still exist on some of these vertical surfaces, which will be there. Um, the finishing pass doesn't always take care of those, but the pencil line will. So then I'll get a nice smooth finish. and and it uses that same uh, two flute quarter inch diameter spiral up cut bit that I use for the roughing operation. Uh, that's the one with the flat end. And it's the same, basically the same feed rate, 150 inches per minute, 40 inch plunge rate, and 16,000 RPM. And then I've checked the cutout only so that it will just run it around the perimeter shape. Now, this is where things get kind of complicated because. I'm using two different tools here. I'm using the same tool for the roughing operation and the pencil finish, but for the middle uh, operation, which is the parallel finish, I'm using a round nose bit. So I have to swap bits twice, once after the roughing operation and then once after the parallel finish. That means after each of these operations, the uh, spindle has to return to the home position down here in the lower left corner. And that allows me to change the bit and then uh, proceed with the next operation. So instead of creating one G-code file for all three operations, I have to create three separate G-code files for each one. That way the rough cut will be done, then I can swap out the bit and proceed with the parallel finish, and when that's completed, I can swap out the bit again and do the pencil finish. And I know this sounds like it's fairly complicated, and all of this is going to sound complicated because whenever you give verbal descriptions of a technical process like this, it always sounds mind-numbingly difficult. But when you actually do it, it goes very quickly, and it's pretty simple. So just keep that in mind. So what I have to do is I have to set my rough carving operation so that the bit will carve out this entire shape and we'll have an appropriate amount of space surrounding the shape. Now, we call the shape of the neck the geometry. And if you look over here under job setup on the left side of the screen, it says distance around geometry. For the rough cutting operation, that needs to be set at 0.25 inches, which is equal to the diameter of the bit. That way, 
the bit knows it's going to carve all the way through this vertical sides the entire perimeter. The uh, however for the parallel operation, I don't want the finish to cut down these vertical sides because it adds a lot of time to the carving and it doesn't achieve anything. It doesn't improve anything and it doesn't give me a result that I want. So what I want to do is restrict the parallel finish just to the contour of this neck as well as the back of the headstock shape and the back of the heel at the uh, he uh, end of the neck here. So what I have to do is I have to fool mesh cam by changing that setting to 0 0.005 inches. And this is something I, I discovered through some experimentation, some trial and error. But this, will, this setting will allow me to cut just those areas without cutting the vertical surfaces, and that will save a considerable amount of time. Those areas will then get cut once the pencil finish is done. So I'll click uh, Calculate Tool Paths here. And again, because I'm using that distance around geometry, as less than the uh, diameter of the bit, it's going to ask me if I would like to change that distance to the to equal that uh, quarter inch diameter bit. And since I don't want to do that, like I said, I'm trying to restrict my roughing operation to just the back of the the neck and the back of the headstock without doing the vertical size. I'll click no. And this is what results. Now, if I turn off the rough operation and the pencil operation, we can now see the the finishing pass and how it's going to carve. It's not going to carve down the sides of the headstock or the sides of the heel, and it will stop just short of the absolute outside edge of the neck. However, when I perform the pencil finish after the, the parallel finish, it will clean that up. So this allows me to do this uh, rather lengthy parallel finishing pass in only 23 minutes. And the end result, like I said before, will be to a level of smoothness where I can just hit it with a little 220 grit sandpaper in preparation for applying, you know, whatever dye or stain or clear coat that I plan to, to lay down on this neck after it's completed. So what I end up having to do is I end up having to save each of my G-code files separately, and you do that by simply deselecting them. And then I'll hit Save G-code. Again, I'll select the basic G-code inch post-processor. And then when I click OK, I can name the file appropriate. And typically for something like this, it would be neck back contour rough carve. And then um, for the finishing pass, I would save that as, you know, uh, neck back contour parallel finish, and then neck back contour pencil finish. So everything is nice and neatly organized. And then what I can do from there is I'll jump back into Easel Pro, and here you you see I've in, I've imported the G code for the rough carving operation, which is shown right here. Then the next carving operation is going to be the parallel finishing pass right here. And you can see, you know, instead of the green lines I showed you in MeshCam, they're now blue lines in Easel Pro, but it's it's the same thing. So it'll perform this carving operation to, to clean up the surface and to remove the steps left over from the rough carving operation and leave a nice smooth finish. And then once that's complete, the pencil finish will run around the perimeter and clean up the vertical surfaces and make them nice and smooth. So what we have here from the start with the truss rod slot, that's going to take about a minute. And then the front of the headstock will take another seven minutes. Then the rough contour of the back is going to take 32 minutes. Then the finishing pass will take another 29 minutes. And then that perimeter cut will take about a minute. So overall, we're looking at uh, an hour, hour 15 minutes to make the neck. And when it's complete, 
I can cut those tabs and liberate the neck from the blank itself. And at this stage, all I really need to do is just some light 220 grit sandpaper uh, finish sanding, and it's it's ready for accepting the fretboard. So overall, it's a, a pretty simple uh, cam process. And I know it, like I said before, it's going to sound really complicated, but it's it's not once you actually start to do it. It goes pretty fast. And uh, it's a, a process that uh, I have found works really well for me. All right, well, that's the basics of my cam strategies for making a neck. Now, in truth, there are more details here. And I have to kind of draw the line between making the files and you know building my 3D files and my SVG files and doing all that kind of stuff, as well as some of the settings that I use for uh, exporting files and that kind of thing. And really a lot of that comes from experience as well as the capabilities of the particular machine that you're using. But I also have to decide, you know, is is my channel going to be about building guitars or using the software that I use for CNC? And I really don't want to get into the, uh, the world of software tutorials. Now, that's not to say I absolutely won't. Perhaps down the road I'll uh, explain a little bit more. But, you know, that's, that's a whole different um, area, a whole different realm. And I really don't want to get too bogged down in talking about how I build my 3D files in Rhinoceros. That's something you can learn on your own. Um, and there are some other settings in MeshCam that I could probably talk about. But again, it depends on the capabilities of your CNC machine. And if I tell you what I use, it may not work with what you're using. So you, to learn what those settings are and how to manipulate them, it just takes some, a little bit of experience. The good news is you're probably not going to wreck too much. <laughs> Uh, that's always a risk with CNC is that you can waste wood. But, you know, if you're smart, you'll use, um, you know, cheap pine wood to kind of test out the process. You'll make some necks out of, you know, cheap, you know, either cheap pine wood or you can use some of that um, pink insulation. Um, I think it's polyurethane foam that you can get at your big box hardware stores. Uh, it's the one that has the pink panther on it. It's kind of a dense foam stuff, but a lot of guys will use that to do some rough carving just to kind of get an idea if the tool paths that they created are viable. Because there's nothing scarier than making a tool path and then clamping down a gorgeous piece of expensive babinga or, um, you know, mahogany or whatever you're going to use for your neck and hope that it's going to work <laughs> and that it's going to result in a usable guitar neck. So um, testing is really key and it's really important and that's what I would recommend when you're de developing and establishing your cam strategies. So at any rate, I hope you found this video to be useful. Uh, if, as always, you know, give it a thumbs up, comment, like, subscribe, do all that good stuff and, you know, show my channel some support and head over to eguitarplans.com and purchase a plan. Uh, you can buy plans for a guitar or some of the tools that I use to build guitars. You can even buy a plan to build your own CNC machine. So, you know, give that some thought. And even if you don't build the plan, just know that your purchase is helping to support my channel and keep me going and offering more videos where I can share some of my insight, not only with CNC, but guitar building in general. So uh, do that. Uh, if you don't want to buy a plan, but still would like to show the channel some uh, so support, you can purchase one of my cool little Highline Guitars t-shirts. Uh, I've got a merch shelf down below, and if you can't see that, there's a link in the description as well, so you can check out those shirts and maybe make a purchase and show your support. At any rate, until the next episode, take care, stay safe, and I'll see you soon.